welcome to a study of heaven. And uh, the uh, handout is going to be very helpful to you. I call it a note guide, really, because that's what it is. It's going to guide you through uh, what we're talking about. It'll help us also manage our time. And I want to be able to manage our time well. And so we're going to start. And if you'll just look there on your first page, and you'll see there Roman number one. The first truth we're going to talk about is God has placed eternity in our hearts. God has placed eternity in our hearts. That comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, from the wisest man who ever lived or who will ever live, from the richest man who ever lived and who uh, ever was, according to the scriptures. And so Solomon concluded in the 11th verse of the third chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, God has placed eternity in our hearts. And all of history has substantiated this fact. And the reality is, is the anthropological evidence shows us that almost every culture, if not every culture, has a God-given sense of the eternal. The, that there's a world beyond this world. There's more to this life than just what we're living now. And so the first point under Roman numeral one is the idea that we will live forever somewhere has shaped every civilization in human history. The evidence of that, I'll give you a few examples. You may know more than these. But the Aborigines in Australia, for example, they picture heaven as a distant island beyond the western horizon. The Mexicans, Peruvians, and Polynesians believe that they, went to the, they would go to the sun and the moon after death. The Native Americans believe that the afterlife, their spirits would hunt for the spirit of the buffaloes and several other things like that. And then in our discovery in the pyramids of Egypt, not only are the bodies embalmed, but there are maps placed beside those bodies as guides to the future world because they had believed that there was a future. And then the Romans believed that the righteous would picnic in the Elysian fields and their horses would be grazing nearby. So we, uh, we can go on and on talking about that kind of thing. Eternity has been placed in our hearts. And so early Christians particularly were preoccupied with heaven. When the church was founded in the first century and when it was under such persecution, we're not surprised that the promise Jesus had made to them about eternal life was something very dear and precious to them. And so as a result, if you go and look in the Roman catacombs, even today, where the bodies of many Christians who were martyred were found and where they were often buried, you'll find literally their tombs there. And you'll see things written on the tombs, such as, in Christ, Alexander is not dead, but lives. Or one who lives with God, or he was taken up into his eternal home. And then one historian points out the fact that the catacomb walls has pictures of the way people imagined heaven would be. But what's interesting about those pictures done in those days is far cry from what we think of heaven today or some of the depictions you see of heaven in that they had drawn beautiful landscapes, children playing, people feasting at banquets and so on. And so they were looking forward to heaven. Not so much today. I mean, even among Christians, are we looking for, forward to heaven? You see there in C, uh, uh, an old cartoon that I came across a, a long time ago. I'll put it up on the screen for you. Uh, and it says, wish I brought a magazine. That's a sad state of affairs, isn't it? And yet, there's so many people that have got this misconception. Um, I read about a pastor who made a confession about heaven. I want to read his words. Now, this is a pastor. I don't know what church he pastors. I don't know his name particularly. Uh, all I know is it's is from something he actually wrote in a book. And he said these words. Whenever I think about heaven, it makes me depressed. I would rather just cease to exist when I die. I can't stand the thought of that endless tedium. It all sounds so terribly boring. To float around in the clouds with nothing to do but strum a heart. Heaven doesn't sound much better than hell to me. I'd rather be annihilated 
than spend eternity in a place like that. Now where in the world would a pastor come up with that kind of depiction of heaven or that kind of thought? Well, I'll tell you where he didn't come up with it from, and that was from the Word of God. Now, John Eldridge is a popular author. Maybe some of you read many of his books. One of his books called The Journey of Desire. He makes a statement in that book. He says, nearly every Christian I've spoken with has some idea that eternity is an unending church service. An unending church service. And we've settled on an image of the never-ending sing-along in the sky. <laughs> One great hymn after another, after another, after another, forever and ever and ever. Amen. Well, if that's all there is to heaven, wouldn't your heart just sort of sink? I mean, really? I mean, is that the forever good news that Jesus Christ died for? That what's the promise for the future is just continual singing and continual worship as much as we love worship. So I have to ask the question, where do these misconceptions come from? Point D. Where do they come from? And personally, I believe there's one central explanation for why so many of God's children have such a vague, negative, uninspired view of heaven. And it's the work of Satan himself. Because some of Satan's favorite lies are about heaven. Look down in that box there. You'll see there that Revelation 13, 6 tells us that the satanic beast opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. Now, we shouldn't be surprised by that, should we? And now we're coming to our very first write downs of the evening. Our enemy slanders three things. He slanders God's person. He slanders God's people. And he slanders God's place, heaven. And is this not what you would expect? We all know how in the beginning in the garden it was the, the slander of God's character and the slandering of his word and causing Adam and Eve to doubt that God's word was really true. That's been going on from the beginning of time because that's one of the greatest strategies Satan has to discourage people, slander God. The biggest question today is God's good. And if God is good, why is there such suffering in the world? And that is the one question that has caused so many people problems and struggles because it's a question that would cause us to doubt God the person. And especially cause us to doubt if God is good, then why are these things to happen? So we're not surprised when you think about it that he would say that God is a person. And then we know he slanders the church, he slanders God's people, he, he does that all the time. He uses God's people to slander each other. He, he does whatever he can to cause the world to doubt our credibility in any way he can, because that's a strategy of his. But I don't know if he's given much thought to the fact that he also wants to slander heaven. But when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Think how maddening it's got to be for him that was his home. That was his place where he had such authority and had such a place and position of honor and such a place of purpose. And now he's kicked out of that home and now we are the ones that are entitled to that home that he was kicked out of. And so what better way for the devil than to try to slander heaven, but he doesn't have to slander. He just has to cause us to think it's going to be boring and uninteresting and something that we really don't want to go to and we want to wait till the last minute to get there and all of those things. And so he doesn't have to convince us that heaven does not exist. He only needs to convince us that it's a boring, unearthly, ethereal place where we can't possibly grasp or understand or imagine what it's like. And, uh, and then what that does is if you have a vague, negative view of heaven, what it does is it takes away your joy. It takes away your anticipation. It takes away your desire to want to even go to heaven. You know, someone kidding 
earlier tonight kind of was joking about the fact that, you know, they thought we were going to get a bus together to go tonight. And every time you hear that joke, everybody's saying, well, I don't want to hear that go tonight. Why not? Because of the misconception we've got about the whole thing. And uh, so if we believe the lie that heaven is boring, that heaven is some kind of ethereal, uh, kind of ghostly, ghastly place, then we will not only be robbed of our joy, but will we share the good news? Will we share the good news? I mean, why should we share the good news? If you got a pastor saying things like that pastor I quoted earlier saying, I mean, no inspiration there to want to go to an eternal destiny. So, we recognize that we're in a spiritually dark world. We're in a spiritually dark place. God has blind, blinded our eyes about God and about His people and especially about heaven. And so, we're going to make a concerted effort in the next few weeks to see what we can do to listen no longer to the lies of the devil, but listen to what the Word of God teaches us and what Jesus says about it and go from there. So, we're on point E now. And there's a question there. Is heaven beyond our imagination? Now, let me give you a minute to think about that. Is heaven beyond our imagination? Are we just wasting our time coming to try to learn about this? Because is it beyond our imagination? Real quickly, somebody tell me what you think. Well, let me just say a show of hands. How many believe it's beyond our imagination? Okay. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever read a verse of scripture that said, No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him? Heard that scripture? Is that Old Testament or New Testament? It's Old Testament. It's Old Testament quoted in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul. Well, and he, he quotes and then he adds a little correction. And so that verse, it can be found in Isaiah chapter 64, verses 3 and 4. And then we can find it quoted again in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Clearly tells us, and I've had so many people, I don't know, 90% of every Christian you would ask would say, you know, well, that's what 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says. It says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. And they stop there. And they don't finish the sentence. That's not what it says. Here's what it says. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. It's not true that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived. Or, it's, let me put it this way. It's not true that we cannot imagine it. It's not true that we cannot get a picture of it. It's not a true thing that we can do that. Uh, because God says, what does that verse say? God says, He has revealed past tense. He has revealed that He is what He's prepared for us through His Spirit. What we otherwise could not know, what we otherwise could not understand, He is talking about our eternal home because He's talking about the place that's being prepared for us. He's talking about God is prepared for us. Not just heaven as a place, but all of the future of what He has in store for us. And it doesn't necessarily relate just to heaven. It can relate to other things in life. But in our case, I think, and in the context, it's not incorrect to say it's also talking about heaven. So, when did he reveal this? If it's past tense. If, if it's past tense, Paul's saying, when did he reveal this? From Paul's perspective, it had to be from the Word of God and specifically from the words of Jesus. Specifically. And from the Old Testament as well. 
There's more in the Old Testament about our eternal destiny there and there is in the New Testament. That's why we don't want to kick the Old Testament out of the book. We don't want to do that. We don't want to just make that mistake. Don't jump on that too quickly. Uh, so, so the question is, when, when did you reveal it? And it's through His Word. Everybody say, through His Word. Through His Word. Wait a minute, Pastor Mal. That doesn't say through His Word. It says, by His Spirit. Well, only problem with that is, Jesus said, My Word is Spirit. My Word is life. And so, in this context, Spirit and Word are synonymous. So, this means, news alert, not fake news, real news. <laughs> this means God reveals to us what heaven is like through His Word. And that's our goal. We're going to help us to imagine from the Word. So, it's not exhaustive. We're not going to answer every question. We don't have every answer. It doesn't say everything that there is to be known about heaven has been revealed through His Word. But what is revealed is accurate. That's the key. God tells us about heaven and His Word. So we don't have to shrug our shoulders and say, well, I'm ignorant of that. Because He wants us to understand. And He wants us to anticipate. And that's why at the bottom of page 2, we have a, a really, really important write down. It's important that we use a biblically inspired imagination because we cannot anticipate, we cannot anticipate or desire what we cannot imagine. How can you get excited about something that you can't even imagine? How can you get inspired if you can't imagine it, if you can't get your mind wrapped around it? And I personally believe that's why God gives us glimpses of heaven in the Bible is to fire up our imagination. The Word of God wants to kindle in us a desire for heaven in our hearts so that we will want to focus on things above. And by the way, that is one of the reasons why Satan will do whatever he can within his power to cause us to be discouraged about reading the Word of God. He does not want you to fill your mind with the Word of God. He does not want you to do that. He doesn't want us to know. He would rather misdirect us, and especially about the place, God's place. So listen up. As long as heaven remains either undesirable or unimaginable, Satan succeeds by sabotaging a desire to set our mind on things above. And what we need is a biblically inspired imagination. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need, say it, you need a biblically inspired imagination. Y'all did that very poorly, by the way. Let's do this again. You need a biblically inspired imagination. Okay, so, so in the next few weeks, ask God to help you to remove the blinders of our preconceived ideas about him so that you wouldn't even laugh at that cartoon the next time you saw one like that. You wouldn't, it wouldn't even bring a smile on your face because it's such a distorted picture of what the truth really is. And when you see a Hollywood movie next time about heaven or you hear someone crack a joke about heaven, you'll think they have no idea. So, if it's not imaginable, if we can't even imagine it, why try? So here's the deal. God has no equal as a person. Amen? Heaven has no equal as a place. I said God has no equal as a person, and heaven has no equal as a place. We were made for a person, and we were made for a place. And Jesus is the person, and heaven is the place. And they're a package deal. You cannot get to heaven without Jesus. And you can't get Jesus without heaven. They come together. Amen? Amen. 
And so our goal for the next four weeks is to obey the command of Colossians 3.1, which says this, Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Let's read it together. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. That's the command. And that's what we're going to do. My bad, I touched this. Now, that's the introduction. Let's pray. And then we'll jump into this. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you that you do not want to leave us in the dark about our eternal destiny. Lord, you have things to show us that I believe, Lord, will change our thinking and change our life. Lord, I pray this very night that, Lord, you will help us to begin the process of taking the steps of faith necessary to set our minds on things above. Lord, we have a tendency to allegorize that. We have a tendency to say that and it becomes just our mantra without us really understanding what we're really saying. But I pray, Lord, that we'll have a new understanding as never before and that you'll give us a handle, an understanding of what your word really teaches and Lord, I pray for everyone here tonight. Lord, first of all, we recognize that heaven is not our automatic destination. Well, we recognize that the price that was paid for us to have an opportunity to end up there, Lord, is just beyond our comprehension. And we thank you, Jesus, for preparing the way. We thank you, Lord, for making available to us what our eternal home will be. The fact that you sacrificed so much that we can have that kind of relationship and that kind of eternal hope. Now, Lord, I pray you open our hearts to receive this truth. And Lord, if we have questions, let us not be afraid to ask. And Lord, also give us time to process this too. Lord, we're not gonna we're gonna be thinking of things tonight we've never thought of before. And we need them all them over. We need to check the word. We need to check these things out. And I ask your blessings over this night in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 We're on uh, top of page 3, Roman numeral 2. What is the nature of the present heaven? What is the nature of the present heaven? One thing that is very clear is the Apostle Paul considered it vital for us to know what happens when we die. I mean now. What happens when they died? What happens when we die? He's so concerned about it that he writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. Those who fall asleep are those who have died. That is the phraseology that is used here. Or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We have hope. We have an answer. And, uh, and so Paul speaks about those who have died as though they have fallen asleep. Because in reality, all that's died is the body. And the person, or part of the person, uh, is uh, going to be with Christ. Now, if we were to be blessed to have lived until Christ returns, then this won't relate to us because when Christ returns and if we've never died, we'll meet him in the air. Paul gives a whole teaching on that that is not our topic for this course. What we want to know about is heaven. And uh, we will talk about uh, that. So uh, when a Christian dies, he or she enters into what is referred to as a transitional period between the time they lived on earth and their body died and what the real promise is for the future when we will be resurrected in our bodies and live with Jesus on a new earth on a new heaven forever and ever. So we've got to understand that. So understand what I'm saying. Understand that the present heaven which is the place where maybe your grandma is it's where my brother is. It's where my mom is. It's where my dad is. Every funeral you've ever gone to, you, everyone goes to heaven in a funeral, by the way. You ever notice that? Anybody been to a funeral that even though you really doubted it, <laughs> uh, usually by the end, they, they, the thought is they're in heaven. Do not make the mistake to think that heaven is an automatic destination. <laughs> it is not automatic. But what I'm trying to say is, is 
when I talk about present heaven, I'm talking about the place that Christians go when they die. And this is what Paul is talking about. Um, and so, by definition, heaven, that heaven, is an intermediate state, a temporary state of sorts. And I'll, I'll explain this as we go. You may want to write in the margin of your paper, Philippians 1.23. Can't put every scripture on the screen. But Philippians 1.23 assures us that the heaven where we go when we die, the present heaven, is by far a better place than this earth, which is under the curse. And when you die, you are immediately in the presence of God and in the presence of Christ. And so, can I hear an amen? amen. That's our hope. But here's the point. We're down to A. And this is an important write down. The intermediate or present heaven is not our final destination. God's children are destined for a life as resurrected beings on a resurrected earth. Much teaching about this, but this also can be somewhat confusing. Now, when we live in heaven, will we be in heaven forever? Absolutely. Will we always be in the presence of God and the presence of Christ? Absolutely. Will heaven always be in the place it is now? No. In the present heaven, we'll be in Christ's presence. And we'll be joyful. And we'll be looking forward. And then you think, well, what you, how could you be looking forward to anything if you're in heaven? Well, what you're going to be looking forward to, that the Bible teaches, is you're going to be looking forward to your bodily resurrection. You're going to be looking forward to the day when your body is going to rise up again out of that tomb. And you're going to have the same body Christ has. A resurrected body. Which next week, a whole session is going to be talking about that pretty much. And, uh, and what that means for us. And so, that's what we're looking forward to. So this is a very important concept. The present heaven is not our final destination. God's children are destined for life as resurrected beings on that resurrected earth. Even Job, way back. By the way, do you know Job might... Many people think it might have been the very first book that was ever recorded or written, even before Genesis, the one that actually was written. Um, and uh, that's a whole other story. But the point of it is, Job is a long time ago, folks, and Job even talked about a resurrection. He had a revelation of, of a resurrection of his body, and we'll talk about that verse eventually. But uh, I want to give an analogy. I started not to do this. I read this analogy. I didn't like it. I twisted it. I, I tweaked it a little bit. See if it helps. Here's the problem. When you're trying to explain something like heaven and you use an earthly illustration that we can relate to, you can kind of lose something in the translation. And so I hope I don't cause more confusion than help by using this illustration. Because I want us to understand this intermediate state from the time we die until the time when we are going to be resurrected. Okay? This present heaven, this intermediate heaven. Uh, here's the illustration. I'm going to actually give two of them. Suppose you lived in a homeless shelter in Miami. I don't like that. Let's, yeah, well, why not? Miami. We could say Atlanta, but it doesn't matter. One day, you hear the news that you're going to inherit a beautiful house, fully furnished, Gorgeous hillside overlooking Waikiki Beach in Hawaii. With that house is going to come a job, a wonderful job, where you can get to do what you've always wanted to do, and you're going to excel at it and be completely fulfilled in it. And so you catch a flight to go to Hawaii when you hear about this inheritance, and then you have a stopover in Dallas. But when you get to Dallas, you discover there's going to be a long layover. And you also discover that you had heard that when you got to this new place, that all your friends and family that had gone before you had, had gone to this place of inheritance, they were still in Dallas, laying over, waiting as well. And then, of course, if the ticket person said to you, well, where are you headed? You wouldn't say, oh, I'm headed to Dallas. You would say, I'm headed for Paradise, Hawaii. That's where I'm headed. Okay. That's kind of giving us an idea 
where heaven fits. But that's what, imagine leaving your homeless shelter in Miami and flying to an intermediate location like Dallas. But instead you discover that, well, wait a minute, the plan really is, is for me to go back to Miami. But only thing is, Miami will have been completely changed. And it'll be so changed, it'll be so new, it'll be so renovated, it'll be a beautiful house, it'll be a glorious place to live, I'll still do the job that I want to live, but not only that, uh, it's pollution free, crime free, sin free, and so you end up living not in a, a different city, but a radically improved version of the old city. Okay? You get the picture? So, that's what the Bible promises for us is that our eternal home is going to be living on a new earth, a resurrected earth, a completely changed earth in which there is no sin. And, uh, and, uh, and we'll live in the presence of God forever because God will come and dwell there forever and ever. Uh, still not perfect illustration, but I think you maybe get the drift of what I'm trying to do. Here's the thing we got to understand about God. I'm going to get theological on you for a minute, but you gotta, you got to think of this. Because part of the reason we get confused about heaven is we think heaven and God are the same thing. And heaven and God are not the same thing. God is a spirit. God is eternal. God always has been. Always will be. Everything else outside of God is created. Heaven is not synonymous with God, nor is it a part of His essential being. He created heaven. He created heaven. Now notice there's a little arrow on point A. Just above the cloud. You see that? Page 3. Because God created heaven, it's not a place where He must dwell. It is where He chooses to dwell. You get that? In fact, before he created heaven, he dwelt wherever he wanted to. Because heaven is a specific place. Heaven is a place where angels live, and living beings live, and living creatures live that we don't even comprehend or completely understand. Heaven appears to be, you know, it's a specific location. That's why I always try to capitalize heaven every time I use the word. I try to capitalize it. Because I want us to understand it's real. It's a place. It's not in our imagination. It's not symbolic. It's not a figure of speech. It's a real thing. Okay? And because God created heaven, it has a beginning. Right? God doesn't have a beginning. He ever has always been. Heaven has a beginning. And so, if it has a beginning then, it's neither timeless nor changeless. Okay? So here's a, something to wrap your mind around. This is a biggie. In the cloud, you see three fill-in-the-blanks. Three fill-in-the-blanks. And I want to try to explain those to you. First of all, heaven has a past. In other words, time before Christ's birth, death, and resurrection. Okay. So there's a past to heaven. Heaven, you know, <laughs> it was there before or probably created before Adam and Eve, perhaps. We don't know, but we think so. Um, it has a past. Now, it changed when God the Father became God the Son, and God the Spirit became both God and man. And so heaven now is the place where believers go when they die, and that's what I mean by the present heaven. A heaven where Jesus is. God was always there. Same, same as God the Son, God the Father. They're always there. But Jesus the man, he was only there after his resurrection. Jesus the man. Follow that? So that's the present heaven. But then there's a future heaven. The eternal heaven. Or the new earth. The new earth. And that's talked about in Revelation 
21 and 22. The last two books of the Bible. Isn't it not very fascinating and very interesting that the first two chapters of the Bible talk about earth and God's creation of the earth and the heavens and man. And the last two chapters talk about a new heaven and a new earth and a resurrected man. You think the two are connected? You think there's been a plan that's been there all along? The purpose has always been? So here's what I want us to understand. The present heaven and the, I mean the past heaven and the present heaven and the future eternal heaven even though it's on earth they're all heaven. When you say heaven you know it's you know it's heaven. Uh, but the eternal heaven the new earth our true home the place where we'll forever live with the Lord and with each other that is our final destination. And so, here's what we're here for. We're going to study heaven. And we're going to speak about this new earth a lot. And much is said about that. But we're going to say things, and the Bible says things about the new earth, the eternal heaven. It says things about it that it doesn't say about the present heaven. In fact, you've got to know which one are we talking about. Or else you can get very confused. Because there's things in the present heaven or in the future heaven that's not in the present heaven. Things change. God created it, right? And, for, and some of this, we have to use our imagination. We don't have direct scripture to, to prove it indefinitely. But one example, take eating and drinking. You know, We'll do that in our resurrected bodies. A lot of scriptures about that in eternal life. But, do they even drink in the present heaven? We don't know. We don't know. Probably not. But it could be. But we don't know. We can't say the definite. And so all I'm trying to say is, is when we describe present heaven, it won't necessarily correspond with the eternal heaven. Okay? I just want us to abandon the assumptions that heaven cannot change. You, 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 you see what I'm saying? God doesn't change. God is immutable, changes. But God clearly says heaven's going to change. In fact, in Revelation 21, verse 1, he says, I'm going to re relocate the whole kit and caboodle to earth. If you want to sum it up, that's what it's going to do. All the people, all the angels, everything's coming to earth. That's really what Revelation 1 says. You say, well, that's probably just symbolic. I mean, is it real? Well, that's what we've got to try to find out. We've got to talk about that. But God doesn't change. So we've got to distinguish between the present and the future heavens. And so someone asked the question, what is heaven like? Well, clearly there's two different answers. The present intermediate heaven is an angelic realm. It's, it's, it's where angels and living beings and human beings are there in some form and we don't know if they have real bodies or not like we do. God is obviously there. Jesus is obviously there. Uh, but by contrast, the future heaven, the new earth, it's going to be more tangible, real for us to, to, to grasp. We can get a better handle on it. The scripture at the bottom of the page is typed out for you. It's right there. Revelation 21, 1 through 3 is the basis of all this. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. The dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. 
They will be his people and God himself will be with them to be their God. Wow, wow, wow. Heavens, God's dwelling place, will one day be on the earth. Why is that so important? Because that God would come down and live eternally with us in a restored, resurrected, brand new earth fits perfectly with his original plan. Think about it. In Genesis, in the beginning, God could have taken Adam and Eve up to heaven for talks. Just doesn't say that. God came down to earth and walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden on the planet Earth. Why? That's the way he wanted it. That's the way he wanted it. He came down. Jesus said that anyone who would be his disciples, and this is in John chapter 14, 23, make a note. Think about this verse. My Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now, that's, we accept that spiritually. Holy Spirit makes a home in my heart and it's all true. But I'm here to tell you that what is now for us spiritual is going to be physical reality in a new heaven and a new earth. So, please note, Roman new will be very key. God's original and ultimate plan all along is not to take us up to live in a realm made for him, heaven, but to come down to live with us in a realm he made for us, new earth. That's his original plan all along. That's kind of like the premises of this course, by the way. Based on what the scriptures teach. Otherwise, if you don't believe this, if you don't accept this, there's scriptures you just can't get. I mean, how are you going to understand it? Because it would make no sense if this is not part of the plan. So you might say, here, here's the fascinating thing about this. There's... The last estimate I had, there's 350 plus books that's ever been written on the subject of heaven where the subject is just heaven. 350 books. 80% of those books don't talk about the new earth. They don't usually delve into the 21st and 22nd chapter of Revelation. Go figure. So a lot of teaching out there about heaven is what I would call Anti-incarnation. It's a fancy word. You know what incarnation is. God coming in the flesh, right? And so, for whatever reason, uh, teachings about heaven are anti-incarnational. That is, they fail to grasp that heaven will be God's dwelling with us. God dwelling with a resurrected people with resurrected bodies on earth. What was the incarnation all about? God taking on flesh and coming and living among us as a human. And that's why the Gospels teach that Jesus was the second Adam. The first Adam failed. The second Adam won the victory, right? And so what I want us to understand is, is God came down, Jesus, to inhabit space and time as a human being. And the new heaven and the new earth is about God making space and time his eternal home. So think about this. Just some things, just to let you mull over and meditate, so maybe, maybe dream about. As Jesus is God incarnate, so the new earth is going to be heaven incarnate. Heaven come down to earth. Jesus came down to earth. Think of Revelation 21 3. God will re relocate his people, his people, and come down with them. And God himself will dwell with them. Think about this. Rather than I going up to live in God's home forever and ever, it's how we normally would think about it, isn't it? God's going to come down and live in our home forever and ever. The home he intended us to have all along. 
So, think about another one. Present heaven, up there. In another dimension. Not accessible to us. Can't connect. Okay? Future heaven, down here. On a planet that we won't recognize. As God intended it to be. So, think about how many times movies have been made, books have been written, believing that man can create utopia, heaven on earth. And there's a lot of books out there. A lot of movies have been made. That's the desire of man's heart. Heaven on earth. The problem with that is, they're going to be all disappointed because they will never bring it to pass. Men cannot do this. Men cannot do this. But the reality of heaven on earth, by that I mean God dwelling with mankind in the, world, in the world, that is actually our destiny. But heaven on earth, it's not man's dream. It's God's dream. Heaven on earth, it's God's plan. Not, not man's plan. And God and God alone with His Son, Jesus Christ, will accomplish it. He will accomplish it. Heaven, it is our destiny. It is our destiny. And by that, we know there's three different ways of looking at it, right? Now, I'm going to give you a little break in just a minute. But first of all, I want to answer, I want to get down to Roman uh, C, top of page 4. Is the present heaven a physical place? What about the present heaven? You know, that, that's, that's where we have a lot of unanswered questions. Is there anything physical in the present heaven? Or is it all just so spiritual and ethereal? And, and you know what I mean by ethereal? Just sort of spirit, and just sort of, you know, we can't get our minds wrapped around it. And, and the reason that is the case is because God is spirit, and we know that. And every description we have of God is the right to life that, that we can't even approach. And we'll talk about that next week. And He is spirit. He's very different from, you know. But, but what I want us to see is heaven and God are not the same thing. Heaven and God are not the same thing. God created heaven. He didn't always dwell there. But He chooses to dwell there. And so, the question is, how can we grow there? Here's the thing about us humans. We need a dwelling place. Thought about that? It's no problem for the all-powerful God, whether it be in a spiritual realm or a physical realm, to dwell. But we need, it. We need a physical dwelling place because as humans, this is who we are. And the real question is whether people... Uh, who are both spiritual and physical can dwell in a place without any physical properties. Can we, can we dwell in a place where there's no physical properties? Would that seem weird to us? So, we know it's no problem for God. I think the Bible teaches it, it would be a problem for us. Here, here's why. You, we, people resist the idea that heaven is going to be on earth or there's going to be a lot of physicality to heaven with God forever. They resist the idea because of false teaching that's, that's been around since the time of Plato. Plato was a philosopher back eons and eons ago. And Plato taught that anything that is material, the word, anything that's material is evil, the earth, things you can handle, anything that is spirit is good. And so he taught the root of a heresy that would have influenced the church over a period of time. Uh, and the human body, evil. But your spirit, good. So there was a separation. So we got to realize that. So that was a long time ago. Well, even in Christian times, when Christ came and Paul was teaching, he would run into teachings uh, that would cause problems and issues. 
Now, this is not a, a seminary class, and I'm, I'm not going to turn into that, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to whet your appetite as much as you want. And I'm going to give something to you, um, another handout. And we're going to take a five-minute break as I pass this handout out. If you want to take a bathroom break after you get the handout, then do that. Come back in five minutes because we've got only about 25 minutes to finish. And, uh, and we've got material to go through. So, but I think you need a break. I need a break because I've been talking for a solid hour. So i got to find right the end Oh, here it is. Okay. During the crucifixion, uh, when Jesus said to the thief, today you will be in paradise. Y'all remember that? And I apologize, I should have capitalized paradise because it's a place. <laughs> it's another word for heaven. Okay? It's another word for the present heaven. It was actually the word most used for the past heaven, before Christ. Okay? In fact, the word comes from the Old Testament, Genesis. Paradise is the word that was used to describe the Garden of Eden. Okay? The Garden of Eden. Um, and uh, in the uh, Old Testament, the uh, Genesis chapter 2 verse 8 says, that after sin came, after the fall, after the fall, God, listen to this, drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim in the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way of the tree of life. Think about that. Why did God do that? And we know from other areas in the Word that he didn't want them to partake of the tree of life, which is another subject for another day, and we'll talk about the tree of life briefly. So, here's the thing that I want us to understand. When sin came into the world, and man fell, Eden, the garden on the earth, the center point, was not destroyed by God. Physically, it was an incredible place. What was destroyed was man's ability to have access to it, to be able to get into it, to have access to it. Uh, but God, there's nothing in the Word of God that says He stripped the Garden of Eden of its physicality, that it's no longer physical, that it's no longer real. And we're not talking about a symbol here. We're talking about a place, a paradise is the word that was used in the Old Testament to describe the Garden of Eden. It's, it's not just a spiritual entity. That's what I'm trying to say. And it appears that the physical paradise was removed to a realm that we can't gain access to. And most likely that realm is the present heaven. That's where the garden is. We know from the book of Revelation that the tree of life is there. If the tree of life is there, the garden of Eden is there. Because the tree of life was the focal point. It was the center point of that garden. And so, the tree of life, is that just a symbol for some spiritual something or another? I can't support that with Scripture. I just, it's a tree. But it's got some assets to it that we don't know much about. So, if it's true that Eden was not destroyed, then... That brings us to uh, that arrow there, a fill-in blank area there, right there uh, at the top of page four. And that is this. The presence of the tree of life in the present heaven suggests that the present heaven possibly has physical properties with physical objects. I think it does. Do people have intermediate bodies there? Do they have any kind of forms of body there? Are they just ghosts? You know, whispery ghosts floating around. You know, that's just where the idea that came from the cartoon, you know, you see, you know, we turn into angels, you know, angels are spirits. You know, you know, they're not physical, but they can manifest 
themselves in bodily form. And so, uh, so maybe that's what can happen to the person who, whose body is buried in the ground on the old earth and is in heaven currently. We have a scripture. Uh, it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 through 4. And uh, it's uh, Paul talking. Well, we did, meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Okay? All right. Uh, now, what Paul is saying is the most uncomfortable thing for a Christian or anyone, but to, is there anything the Christian fears about death? If he knows he's got eternal life, the answer should be no. But there is one thing that Paul was uncomfortable with, and that was being without his body. What was that going to be like? And he, he just was wrestling. This is what this verse of Scripture is about. Uh, because God created us as humans. And what was a human being a human being? You know, when God created Adam, what did he make first? The body. Shape, form. Then what did he do? He breathed his spirit into it. Now, that's not like human. That's what he did. We are spirit and body. A human being has to have a body and spirit to be human. Okay? And to be human the way God can be, I'm not talking about spirit in the sense of, of uh, breath or, or air or oxygen. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about God's spirit. Okay? God intended for His spirit to live in our body. And a, man, a human being the way God designed Him was His spirit living in His body. But His body was made first. But he was not intended to live as a spirit without a body. Otherwise, why is there so much in the Bible about the need for our bodies to be resurrected? If we're just going to be spirits in heaven, just kind of ghostly around, then why do we need to look for... Why, why does it say that they're looking forward to their resurrection? So, the point of all that is, I personally believe that there's physical properties in the present heaven. Um, and I'm going to have to cut this short, so I'll mention a few things of what that, what that could be. First of all, let, let, let me just say this about resurrection. You do understand the resurrection is not a one-at-a-time event. You know? you know, no one has been, only one person has been resurrected ever. Jesus Christ. He's the first. No one else has been resurrected. Okay? Not in the sense with a glorified body. That's all coming. Okay. I'm not saying no one's ever come back from the dead. I mean, God raised some bodies from the dead, but not the head the same old body. <laughs> same old simple, contaminated body. They didn't have a glorified body like Jesus' body. Follow me? So, uh, so what I'm trying to say is, is resurrection is not a one-time event. It's going to happen at the same time for everybody. It's going to be a big event. It's going to be an incredible day when it happens. So why is the resurrection of the body so critical to God's plan? You cannot have continuity of a person without a body. In other words, you got to have your body. I mean, how are they going to know who you work if you don't have a body? And so one of the things we're going to look at is continuity. But here's the one indisputable fact. Here's the one thing I know that's physical in heaven. Here's one proof. Jesus. He is a man. Fully man, fully God. Same body that was crucified on the cross. Same body that was resurrected from the dead. Same body that ascended into heaven. Seated at the right hand of God. And because of that, that brings us to this next point. Because Christ's body in the present heaven has physical properties, it stands to reason that others in the present heaven might also have physical properties. Okay? Alright. So, that's an important write-down. Uh, 
Now, I personally think, you know, if that's the case, and some other things we've seen, you know, Stephen, for example, he was being martyred, stoned, in Acts chapter 7, verse 56, uh, and he saw into heaven. God gave him the ability to see in heaven, and it says he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What was he standing on? Was he just floating around? Has he been floating around? I don't think so. I think there's a physical problem. That's what I'm trying to say. So now we want to delve with the question, what is life like in the present heaven? What is life like in the present heaven in the next 15 minutes? What is life like in the present heaven? We're down to D. And we can learn a great deal about that uh, by just reading three verses of Scripture. I want us to read them. And then uh, I'm going to give you opportunity to, uh, to look at this. But look at what this says. We'll read this. It says, I saw under the altar the souls of those who have been slain because of the word of God. I'll read it from up there. Uh, they called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth? and avenge our blood. Then it goes on. Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed, just as they had been. Now, there in point D, you've got 20 observations from three verses of Scripture. This came directly out of Randy the Alcorn's book on heaven. What is life like in the present heaven? This is worth a read. I was going to have you, with the time we had permitted, we were going to read through this. Uh, I don't think I have time, but I want to. I just want to jump on some of them. And so I'm going to just read them instead of uh, sharing a mic for you to read them. But first of all, here's what we know. When people died on earth, they relocated to the present heaven. Okay, we know that from just those three verses. Number two. Those people in heaven were the same ones killed for Christ while on earth. This demonstrates a direct continuity between identity on earth and identity in heaven. The martyr's personal history extends directly back to their lives on earth. The, those in the present heaven are not different people. They are the same people relocated. Righteous men made perfect. Okay? Um, number three. People in heaven will be remembered for their lives on earth. Will be these were known and identified as the ones slain because of the testimony they had maintained. And then number four says they called out um, and, uh, and also it says that they raised their voices and they did it in unity in verse five. Um, I want us to go down and uh, look at verse number seven. The martyrs are fully conscious, rational, and aware of each other, God, and the situation on earth. Okay? Here's an interesting look at number nine. Well, look at number eight. They ask God to intervene on earth and act on their behalf. How long? Till you judge the inhabitants of the earth. No, number nine. Those in heaven are free to ask questions, which means they have an audience with God. It also means they need to learn. In heaven, people need understanding, and they'll pursue it, at least in the present heaven. It's interesting, isn't it? Now, you, the more you read through this, it's worth a read. Please take time to read it. Uh, and what I'm going to try to do is hit some high points that I think uh, I, I would rather do um, and, uh, in the next few minutes. What I got from this is heaven's inhabitants will likely remember much more in heaven than they did on earth. Aren't you glad for that? In heaven, they're going to remember much more. Uh, and I think Perhaps they will even know uh, maybe a little more about why things happened the way they did. Uh, number two, uh, there's records of life on earth in heaven. There's a reference in Malachi chapter 3 verse 16 that talks about the scroll of remembrance Amen. that is being written even now in heaven until the time for things to be revealed. That's a scary thought. Uh, memory is uh, such an important part. 
But um, the question that's frequently asked that I want to address before we go is um, I want us to understand that these scriptures, that scripture alone teaches the principle that those who are currently in heaven, my mom, my dad, my brother, others who have gone on, maybe you've got loved ones there too, you know someone, they have an awareness of what's going on in there. There's an awareness of what's going on earth. These martyrs were aware. Now, I don't think they're sitting around watching everything that's happening on earth 24-7 like the news. In fact, that wouldn't be healthy. We shouldn't be sitting around 24-7 looking at the news. But what I want us to do understand, though, is that I, I just can't believe that if Jesus is going to come back with all those saints who are when it's time for him to come back, and time gets the way it is, but that time will come, that they're going to be coming back ignorant of what's happening on planet Earth. I mean, I have a hard time thinking they're going to be ignorant of that. And so the bottom line with this is, and this is kind of an extra write-down, if you want to write it down, put it in the margin. Uh, it's not a fill in the blank. But... Uh, Based on the scriptural evidence, departed saints currently in present heaven, I believe they intercede in prayer. Why would they not be praying? What is praying? Talking to God. I mean, duh. I mean, are they not going to be talking to God? They, they want an answer to questions, did they not? And so, I mean, I, I have to believe they're going to be talking to God more in heaven than we talk to God here on earth. I mean, it, it, it at least makes sense to me. I can't find any scriptural proof that they don't intercede and they don't pray. I can't find any scriptural proof of that whatsoever. Um, and uh, so that's the one thing that I want us to understand. But here's the other thing, and the reason people don't believe this, is wait a minute. If Grandma and Grandpa and my mom and dad are up there and they're watching things that are happening to me, isn't that going to rob them of their joy in heaven? I mean, I, won't that ruin heaven for them? And it doesn't ruin heaven for God. It doesn't ruin heaven for the angels. Um, joy will be predominant. I'm not saying it won't be predominant. But I believe that uh, we misunderstand the scripture, misunderstood the scripture. And it's the scripture right here. It's the most used scripture. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Okay. Is that talking about the present heaven or the future heaven? It tells us. It tells us right there. For the old order of things have passed away. Have the old order of things passed away? No, they haven't passed away. If the old order of things have passed away, why would Jesus be interceding for us, which we know he's doing? And if Jesus is interceding for us, why wouldn't his followers be interceding for us? Make sense? So does that mean there's going to be periodic sadness in present heaven? Do you think Christ is grieved over what he's seeing on planet Earth? Do you think whatever knowledge we might have on planet Earth, that it wouldn't affect us? If we're living in the presence of Christ, are we going to be less compassionate or more compassionate? I mean, if we're right with Jesus in His very presence in heaven, in the present heaven, are we going to be less compassionate than we were on earth? I don't think so. So, here's the thing. It's one thing to no longer cry because there's nothing left to cry about. Which will be the case when Jesus is establishing the earth. But it's something else to no longer cry when we're still suffering on the earth. Now, but there's a difference. These people that are in heaven now, they have a, 
do they need to be sheltered from the bad things that are happening on planet Earth? And the only way they can be happy is, is don't let them know what's happening down there. God protect them. They're going to have a whole different point of view. And, and what did we learn from the martyrs? They had a whole different understanding of judgment. Bring it on, God. Let's get this over with. Because they understood what that was going to mean. And they understood justice was going to be done. And it was a good thing, not a bad thing. It was not something to, to dread. It was something to look forward to. And so, I personally think that what this teaches us is some things about the present heaven. Just those three verses. Those may be the most key three verses about what's going on in the present heaven. I wish we had had time to read all 20 observations. Make, promise yourself that you'll, you'll read that soon before you get too busy. Uh, and, uh, and recognize that. Amen? Amen? Okay. Well, five minutes early. How about that? Let's pray. Father, we thank you.